First of all, thank you very much for coming on to this show. I'm very, very excited to talk to you. Um, You're more than welcome, Doug. Thank you. So I know you don't know me, but I know a lot about you because I spent a lot of time, as you know, through my email, deprogramming mm -hmm. from Scientology. I grew up in a cult, and I also grew up mm -hmm. with a narcissist. Not dissimilar to your situation, I grew up with a narcissistic mother and sort of that whole family dynamic, which led into the cult. Mm -hmm. Running across your information um, about four or five years ago, mm -hmm. HG, I've studied a lot about narcissists and sociopaths once that clicked in that that was the mm -hmm. key aspect. But I ran across a lot of false information. You know, I get mm -hmm. uh, some from Sam Vodkin. I'd get some from over here, some from over there. It didn't click until I, I came across your information. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to... Um, I just wanted to say thank you. You really helped to kind of save my life in a certain way. And the reason I brought you on is because I talk about cults on my channel, which to me is the same as being in an abusive relationship with a narcissist, a sociopath. And I wanted to invite you on to inform the audience of this most important subject, or at least I consider it most important. So with that background, could you please tell people a little bit about you and how you came to be a narcissistic psychopath how you came to do what you do and just whatever else you'd like to say to introduce yourself okay well i'm hg tudor that's a pseudonym i keep my real identity private and secret for reasons that are pertinent to what i do professionally amongst other things and as you've identified i'm a narcissistic psychopath not self-proclaimed as many people say but get uh, wrong I'm diagnosed as that, and I do a number of things professionally which people don't need to know about, and the reason that people have heard about me, know about me, is that I provide through a variety of platforms uh, the best information that you'll receive about narcissism to allow you to make sense of it, to understand what it is and how it functions, and most importantly of all, your role in it and what you can do about it. And I deliver it in a manner which isn't scientific. I'm not a psychologist, though, though some people think that I am. I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a doctor. I am a narcissistic psychopath and provide you with understanding of the way that my kind thinks. I've been surrounded by narcissists all through my life. As you indicated earlier, my mother is one. I have an uncle who's one. I have a cousin who's one. There are other members of the extended family who are narcissists. I've dealt with them through my work, I've dealt with them socially, I've dealt with them in other situations appertaining to what I do commercially and professionally. And it's very important for people to understand about narcissism because it's pervasive. And there is nobody in the world untouched by narcissism, whether it's a ruinous romantic relationship that you've been involved in, bullied at work because of your boss, harangued and tormented and scapegoated by a family member, or you have a difficult neighbour, you have a particular client whose needs can never be satisfied, or that you're a resident of a country, because invariably your political leader will be a narcissist. Nobody's life is untouched by narcissism, and the extent by which it is touched varies. And when people start to understand narcissism, one of the things they often say to me, Doug, is it's like being given a key that is unlocked an understanding to a lot of our human behavior, that they start to see how narcissists have been prevalent throughout their life and how in many different situations, they realized if they had known about it, they would have been able to deal with the situation in a different and more effective way, usually by not getting so upset or worked up about what happened. And that's not just about romantic relationships where they worried about something in a work situation and they tried and tried to solve it. And years later, they look back and think, that colleague, that boss, that client, that supplier that was so difficult. I was dealing with a narcissist. If only I'd known at that time, I could have dealt with it differently. Or I always wondered about my mother or my brother or that neighbor and so forth. So it is like being given the key to understanding. Now you asked me, how did I come to be what I am? Well, uh, that was a combination of, I have a genetic predisposition um, in terms of my psychopathy and narcissism and the abuse that I was um, exposed to as a child, combined with my genetic predisposition, with the consequence that I became what I am. 
It's a self-defense mechanism, and it's created from that genetic predisposition. And what I call a lack of control environment, in my instance, my lack of control environment was a combination of abuse and something I call the grade B environment, which is you score two goals, why didn't you score three? You got 75% in your exam, why didn't you get 80%? You came second, why did you not come first? Run faster, jump higher, climb further. It was never good enough. And a combination of that and the abuse meant that I had no control over my environment as a child. And my narcissism, combined with my psychopathy, arose as a defense mechanism to enable me to defend myself. And that is how I came to be what I am. That was fascinating. Um, we're only five minutes deep. Um, wow, I have like 10 questions just based off of that. Well, I okay. guess that leads into my first question, HG. But before we get to that, just because I'm I'm familiar with your work, but I'd like my audience to kind of be up to speed since they might be brand new to this. Okay. Could you could you please give a brief breakdown of the different cadres of um, of narcissism and how you mm. scale it as compared to all the different information that's out there? They can get very confusing, and there's a lot of bullshit out there, and there's a lot there of uh, false information. And I know you know that. So how 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 do you yeah. break it all down? Okay. There is a lot of misinformation that's out there. Unfortunately, as a consequence of the plethora of material that social media allows to be advanced, there are many people, well-intentioned, nevertheless, they get it wrong. You either have people who are victims of narcissists who want to share their experience, and that provides value to an extent, but it's a crowded marketplace, and they're not really adding anything new and they don't fully understand narcissism, why would they? And moreover, they tend to propound existing myths about uh, narcissists. And then you get some individuals who are of a um, scientific and medical background, and they will have an understanding, but they might not have experienced it. And as anybody who'll tell you, until you've been through it, you don't really get a handle on it. And those individuals tend to talk in more scientific and esoteric terms, which they may understand, but the audience does not, and therefore there's a failure of communication. My work is uh, much more complete. There's plenty more I need to convey to people, and I provide you with the correct information, not the myths. So there's a lot of rubbish that's written about narcissism that's incomplete, inaccurate, and sometimes downright dangerous and misleading. Now, my classifications are by school and cadre. So... I'll deal with the cadre first. There are four cadres, somatic, cerebral, elite, and victim. There are different traits and characteristics applicable to all of those cadres, and the cadres bolt onto the school. Not all of the cadres are applicable to all of the schools that I'm about to tell you about, um, but they generally appertain to most of them. And so in order to help people understand what they're dealing with, I provide those cadres which are a particular flavour of narcissists. So, for example, by way of uh, conveying it, you'll have a somatic narcissist who will have traits appertaining to the fact that they'll have a preoccupation with money. Now, they might be very tight with that money, but they can still be somatic, or they might be very generous. They may be very good-looking, or they think they're very good-looking. They may be very body conscious or think that they've got a great body, but they're deluded. And that links into the nature of the school. And they're interested in going to fancy restaurants and being seen at the right places and nightclubs and bars and going on holiday and buying clothing and looking good. And they're often hypersexualized. And it might be they like a lot of sex in the thought of fairly narrow category, or they may have very wide-ranging sexual tastes, which might border more towards what people describe as deviancy and degenerate behaviours. And so the somatic is the largest cadre that exists and has that whole different range. And there are different char characteristics which appertain to cerebral elite. Elite is a combination of somatic and cerebral, and then also the victim, narcissist cadre. So those are the cadres. They bolt on to the schools. I divide into essentially four schools with various sub-schools, three of those schools. So the schools are lesser, mid-range, greater, ultra. And then the sub-schools are lower, lesser, middle, lesser, 
upper lesser type A, upper lesser type B, lower mid-range, middle mid-range, type A and type B, upper mid-range, lower greater, middle greater, and upper greater. And I categorize in that way because there are so many different strands that appertain to narcissists. There are certain things that are in common from all of narcissists, i.e. we must have control, we must obtain fuel, we have no emotional empathy, and we manipulate. But then there are considerable differences. Some narcissists will use physical violence regularly, some will rarely do so at all. Some are aware of what they are, others have no awareness at all. Some are passive-aggressive, some are aggressive, some utilise charisma, others have none. Some have a low cognitive function, some have a high cognitive function. Some expose their behaviours by way of heated fury, rage, physical violence, destruction of physical property. Others exhibit cold, ignited fury, which is silent treatments, cold shouldering, glaring, sulking. And so I created these categories, this lexicon, to help people understand because ordinarily, the sort of common or garden understanding of a narcissist is an alpha male who eats what he kills, who fancies himself rotten, shags everything that moves, thinks that he's fantastic, stares at his reflection in the mirror for hours on end. Now, that's just but one type of narcissist. And most people, if you say, what's a narcissist, and they have any degree of understanding, if at all, go for what I've just explained. Oh, somebody who thinks really highly of himself, he thinks he's brilliant, they're really vain. That is one narrow aspect of the narcissist. And so I categorized across all of these various schools and subschools to help people understand the differing natures. Because then, when you appertain what type of narcissist that you're dealing with, and I offer a NARC detector consultation to allow that classification to be achieved and give you reasons why, you will then have a better understanding of where to look amongst my very wide-ranging encyclopedia of information to get more information about those particular, that particular type of narcissist. It also means you gain a lot of assurance because, again, there are so many myths propounded about our kind that people fall into traps. And when you get the information that, for instance, you might be with a lower mid-range narcissist, you realise, although the situation is not pleasant, at all, it's not as worse as you imagined it to be. And that there are certain behaviours you thought that you were going to be subjected to that won't happen because that type of narcissist doesn't behave that way. So providing those classifications, Doug, is part of enabling people to understand the nature of the narcissist, how he or she thinks, the way that they behave, do they operate with a facade, do they not have one, what type of manipulations are they most likely to use, do they, are they aware of what they are? And then also to allow you to know what they're unlikely to do or least likely to do, which will give you a degree of assurance and comfort. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, HG. Um, you know, you mentioned, I'm very curious about this myself because I wonder why I didn't turn into a narcissist or a sociopath because I grew up with a mother. HG, the only reason I wound up in Scientology is because okay. I feel like that was sort of um, a harmonic on the family dynamic that I had. Okay. I never would have taken to it if somebody had approached me with a Dianetics book or any kind of Scientology because I rejected it a couple hundred times in my childhood as bullshit. So yeah. I, um, I can see now from today's perspective that my family dynamic had a lot to do with my own sociopathy and narcissism. Now, you said that somebody... I believe has to become that way is born that way through a genetic predisposition as well as a controlled environment. I felt mm -hmm. like I grew up in that too. I felt like I mm -hmm. was a sociopath for most of my mm -hmm. life, to be honest with you. And only when I sort of deep, when I healed and, and found that this information, which caused the healing process, mm -hmm. then only then did I start to become who I really would have been without my mother's or the cult's influence. And that took a long time. So I'm wondering what would be the difference between me and you? Or I, I imagine it would be the genetic predisposition that would make the the big difference because I feel like I too grew up in a controlled environment with a with a 
mm-hmm. maybe not as an extreme family and, and narcissistic dynamic as you had in your life, but mm-hmm. I had similar aspects. So why does one person, like let's say you have two siblings in the same mm-hmm. family and you have the mm-hmm. same environment, why would one become a narcissist and the mother and the other uh, might not? Okay, as I mentioned, in order to create a narcissist, you must have two aspects to it. The seed, the genetic predisposition towards narcissism. And then you ally that with the soil, which is the lack of control environment. Now, you may have brother and sister. They have the same parents. Brother becomes a narcissist, sister does not. Why? Starting point would be the genetic component is missing for her. It's skipped. So in the same way, mother, father and son all have brown hair. She has blonde hair. The brown hair didn't become evident with her. So that genetic aspect that would allow her to become a narcissist is missing. Thus, she didn't become one. Alternatively, it was there, but she was not subjected to the lack of control environment to the appropriate degree that allowed narcissism to form, whereas her brother did. Now, you might think, well, how could that be if they grow up in the same household? Well, my sister is an empath, she's codependent. My brother is an empath, and I'm a narcissistic psychopath. We grew up in the same household, and we are blood-related in full. They didn't go down the path I did, because either they skipped the genetic component, or, and I think this is more likely in my circumstances, or they didn't get exposed to the same lack of control environment that I did, even though we lived in the same Them, and he didn't protect me and therefore they had what I call an intervener so in certain instances a child might find themselves in a particular environment and may actually have the genetic predisposition but there's an intervening factor which It's G. I'm losing. I'm losing. I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm losing. I'm sorry to interrupt, H. G. I'm losing audio a little bit. Could you maybe go back a couple sentences because you were cutting out for some reason? Sorry about that. Sorry. Can you hear me? Okay, H. G. I feel like the. I. I feel like the. Um. You were cutting out a little bit on this end. It, uh, dropped out. Okay. okay. It, uh, drop, it dropped out shortly there. So, as I was explaining, think of it like a cake. So, in those circumstances, you've got all of the ingredients that all go together, and you put them in the oven. And if you take the cake out halfway through when it's being baked, it doesn't become the cake that it ought to be. So, similarly, if an intervener gets in the way, shields the child in some way, takes them away from a lot of the, or some of the behaviors in that lack of control environment, they won't become a narcissist. So sometimes it might be that one of the parents manages to shield a child, so they never become, so they have a parent who's a narcissist, but they don't become one themselves. Sometimes it might be a grandparent, they go and spend more time with grandma. Sometimes it's school that provides that intervener. There's a variety of reasons. Do you think that, um... (sighs) Uh, that brings me to, um, I, I want to get into, you just keep re- getting more and more questions going in my head, sure. but I do want, I do have a main body of question to get into, you know, cause we're talking sure. about cults and stuff, but let me just say this to the audience that, and then I'd, I'd like to get your perspective. This is the next question to me being in Scientology, um, I don't know how much you do or don't know about it. You're you know, free to tell me if you have any knowledge about that cult specifically. And I'd like to also let people know that he did an amazing breakdown of Nexium um, about a week ago. 
Uh, I'm going to leave a link in the description to all of his information and that Nexium video and stuff. But the, he does have a, a, a background on cults as well. First of all, can you tell me if you do, do know anything about um, Scientology itself? And then also, to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, is it not the same exact dynamic as being in an abusive relationship with a narcissist, psychopath, or sociopath by being in a cult, maybe on a grander or more you know, worldly scale, or is it, is it mm. is exactly the same thing, or am I am I off on that? No, I mean, I, uh, first of all, I do have an awareness of what Scientology is. I wouldn't claim to be an expert on it, though. And by being involved in the cult, it is uh, very similar to being in, let's say, a romantic ensnarement with a narcissist. Invariably, cults are led by narcissists and have narcissists operating within them as lieutenants and members of coterie to the um, governing narcissist, if I can put it that way, is the cult leader. And consequently, the, your involvement as a non-narcissist when you're in that environment is one where you will be repeatedly exposed to the behaviours and manipulations of narcissists in terms of, first of all, seducing you into the cult and then keeping you in the cult. So the cult will pour honey on you to draw you in. And in the way that a narcissist will pour honey on you in order to draw you into any kind of relationship with a narcissist, friendship, working relationship, but more commonly romantic relationship. And then when you are brought under that control, that control has to be maintained. And that is done through a variety of means. For a period of time, you're treated to benign manipulations, but then malign ones will be used against you. And similarly, when you're in a cult, you will have that. You'll be promised rewards. But often, when you first arrive, you're often invited to provide some kind of collateral, because then that can be used against you should you then try and leave. Individuals often find from cults that if they make noises about leaving, that certain people are dispatched to them from doing so. And if they manage to leave, then they find themselves being subjected to a campaign of harassment and bullying because they're now on the outside. And so there's a whole range of manipulative behaviours that are utilised because invariably in, in cults, narcissists operate within those environments and therefore you are subjected to their narcissistic manipulations as you would be in a one-on-one -on -one relationship with a narcissist. Do you think that... Um... <sighs> Do you, I wanted to ask you this. We let's take um, Keith Raniere of the Nexium cult, L. Ron yeah. Hubbard of Scientology, Charles Manson of the Manson cult, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Do yeah. you, are all of these? Nar First of all, are they all deaf? In order to be a cult leader, do you have to have no conscience? You have to have. I, I often said I learned so much from this cult experience that if I didn't have a conscience, I could make a lot of money in this world, manipulate the shit mm -hmm. out of a lot of people. But I can't mm -hmm. fucking fucking do it, HG. No. You know, no. I, I can't do. So are they all? In order to be a cult leader, one, do you have to have no conscience? And two, are they all necessarily what you would call greater narcissists, i.e. those that are aware, consciously aware of what they're doing? So many people have wondered, did L. Ron Hubbard, for example, know he was manipulating people or did he believe in his own bullshit because he, he did the auditing? He did his own technology on himself. So which is mm -hmm. it? You know what I mean? Well, first of all, with regard to are all cults run by narcissists, it very much depends on the nature of the cult. Of course, there is a somewhat stigmatic association with the idea of what is a cult, um, that it is an organisation, that is an alternative form of religion that uses control over its members and subscribes to particular, tra particular behavioural traits. So if we're talking in the traditional sense, whereby there is invariably a charismatic leader, that draws people in and entices them, that they are persuaded to forego outside contact, that they give themselves in totality to this cult, subscribe to a particular set of rules and procedures and behaviours and beliefs, and that there is a uh, reward system and there is a hierarchy and there's a possibility of progression, but there is also uh, measures that are in place that, to prevent people from departing and breaching the standards and secrecy associated with this cult, then the answer is yes, they will be led by narcissists um, because it is only those type of individuals that would behave in such a way to its membership because an empathic person wouldn't do that. 
an empathic person wouldn't look to isolate. An empathic person wouldn't look to manipulate. An empathic person wouldn't look to take advantage of people sexually, financially, wouldn't threaten, abuse those individuals. So, yes, they will be run by uh, narcissists in the traditional sense of what a cult is. Are they all greater narcissists? No, there'll be some which don't know what they are and don't need to know what they are, but many will have an awareness uh, of what they are doing, know that they're being manipulative, but don't care because they have no emotional empathy. Excellent. Thank you. Um, do you think that... Uh, this brings me to what my next question, which is we just had an election here. I call it a farce, but we just had an election, as you know, in the U.S. with... Uh, Biden. Has, it, has there been an election? I would never have noticed. Yeah, I know. I know you guys don't get the news over there, and it's, it's kind of low-key. No, we've, we've, we've just try got to propagandize people's minds right. with that we've shit everywhere. We've just got electricity. It's uh, very exciting. Yeah, yeah. You literally have to not have electricity in order to not, <laughs> not know what's going on, obviously. But, man, I thought that video that you did on, yeah. on that break... You're, if you guys don't know, this guy's absolutely fantastic at breaking down uh, caricatures called Meghan Markle and what have you, and 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 taking uh, famous people and and breaking them down as to whether or not they are or are not a narcissist. Um, you know, so you had this video where you said it was um, not an election, but narcissist versus narcissist. Um, yeah. To paraphrase, mm -hmm. one, could you explain a little bit more about that? And mm -hmm. two. Particularly, what are the implications on maybe not just the U.S. and the people under said narcissist control, but perhaps the population in general, however you see it? Okay. Most political leaders are narcissists. The reason for that is to get in that position, to have an unwavering conviction that you are right and other people are wrong to be able to, in effect, suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortunes, as Hamlet said, to be able to tread on people, pull them off the ladder, to make what are often very difficult decisions, and that you don't see things in grey, lends itself to narcissists because of our worldview of you're either with me or you're against me, black or white. Now, it then becomes an environment which... In order to survive in it, you need to be a narcissist. If you're a non-narcissist, yes, there are non-narcissists that do survive, and sometimes they're successful, but they tend to be the exception. So it's a particular viper's nest that draws our kind to it. And invariably, because of that, you get narcissists collide. And narcissists reside on the political right and the political left and the political center. So... In the case of the recent uh, presidential election, uh, we've witnessed two narcissists colliding, and we witnessed them four years ago with Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Those were two narcissists colliding again there. And in most presidential elections, you see two narcissists colliding. And of course, we saw it in full-on crikey vision during the first televised debate, where there was this unedifying spectacle between two narcissists, and that's what I analyzed in my video, When Narcissists Collide, Trump Against Biden. And you have two individuals who are, their foundation is the necessity of, of maintaining and achieving control over everybody else. And so each time Biden would say something, it would threaten Trump's control, so he would then fight back which would then threaten Biden's control. And it's like a tennis match, it goes back and forth, back and forth. Threat to control, they have to contain it and then assert their own control. Now, certain narcissists do it in a very polished manner, statesmanlike. Unfortunately, in that first presidential debate, which I analyzed, statesmanship went straight out of the window and it was more like a food fight. And so that analysis, and I invite people to listen to it or they can read about it on my blog, Knowing the Narcissist, gives you a breakdown of the behaviours. And I emphasise, I never do these analyses from a point of view of whether the person is good or bad, because those are not objective uh, considerations. But rather, is the person a narcissist or not? And in this instance, two narcissists, 
what happens when you get them in a debate together, what happens when they collide. Because it's useful to understand that. It's useful to understand it politically. And also, you will see it in families. Narcissists collide sometimes. You see it in relationships. There are two narcissists that come together. Now, you ask me, what are the ramifications for the populace when their leader is a narcissist? Well, as I explained earlier on, most leaders are narcissists. And it very much depends upon the nature of the regime. If you are unfortunate enough to be living in a totalitarian one and you don't agree with the uh, dogma of the leader, you'll probably find yourself rounded up in the night and carted off to some uh, concentration camp style prison camp somewhere and uh, you can get a very unpleasant existence in the freezing northern wastes of somewhere or some salt mines. In other instances, you may find yourself being subjected to uh, uh, libelous accusations in government controlled press. In more democratized environments, you will find that certain leaders, if you accord with what they what their dogma is, what they stand for, then you will find them to be an effective leader because you have aligned behind them. If you don't, then you will find the individual odious, not for swaying, and you've got a problem because what you want for your nation isn't being provided for by your leader. But that's democracy. You, the, the vote speaks. And if you don't agree, if the person you voted for hasn't been successful to secure the appropriate mandate, then you've got to suck it, and, uh, suck it up and deal with it. Um, but be under no illusion that any leader that is a narcissist, what they do is all about the United States of them and not for the good of the country. Sometimes those interests coincide because what the narcissist wants to achieve is also good for the country. But it's narcissist first, country second. Many people don't realize that. And that's a big, big thing not to realize, which leads into the next question, HG. Is this world set up, or shall we say, maybe it's not set up, but the narcissist makes it so? Do narcissistic people have more of a desire to seek positions of power, high positions of power in society? Will they be more likely to seek out control? over other yeah. people and to seek to dominate. And, there, and and is there any way to kind of maybe mitigate HG that or stop that? Because I know, and you know, the effect that that has on those mm. under them. So mm. once they're in power or they step over everybody to get to the top, mm. millions or billions of people could be subjected to that kind of um, effect of being in an abus abusive relationship with a narc mother, for example. Mm -hmm. So how, how would that be mitigated? And, well, first of all, does that happen? And are positions of power mostly sought after by narcissists? Do they get to the mm -hmm. top? And then mm -hmm. how would you prevent that, mitigate it, or, or, or handle that in any way? Okay. Because we are created from the crucible of a lack of control environment, we become hypersensitive to the issue of control. So we have very sensitive antennae that pick up on a threat to our control from our perception. So there'll be circumstances that occur with you, Doug, that you won't pick up on as threatening your control in the slightest. Other instances, you might see it, but you think, well, there's nothing I can do about it. I don't sweat it. In other instances, you, you will do something about it and you'll largely do it in a constructive way governed by your emotional empathy. But with my kind, we have a hypersensitivity to the issue of control. So in the way the dog hears frequencies that you and I cannot, the narcissist perceives threats to control. Remember, it's not what you intend, it's how the, it's how the narcissist perceives it. And therefore, because we must always control our environments and everybody in them, what better way to do that than become top dog, become president, become prime minister, become the CEO, become the head of a cult, become the captain of a team, become the principal of a school, become the patriarch in the family. And so any position of power, whether it be within a sporting team or organization within government, within the armed forces, within 
entertainment. I want to be top of the tree. I want to be number one in the charts. I want to sell the most records. I want to be the wealthiest. I want to be the most watched entertainer on television. The narcissist wants to get to the top, however you measure the top, because then that allows the narcissist to assert control. And in that journey to get there, because of that desire for control, and it doesn't apply to all narcissists because some lack the ability to do it and their narcissism doesn't steer them towards it. There are some that would like to get there, but they lack the minerals to do it, so they fail. But we are overrepresented in the upper echelons of society in terms of positions at the top of organizations, government, etc., because empathic people are less concerned about getting there. There are numerous empaths that get into top positions. It's not to say that, not to say that they don't. But narcissists are overrepresented because our need for control is given a conduit by enabling us to get into those positions. So they cater for what we need. Furthermore, we need fuel. We need the emotional response of people. Therefore, if we sit in a cupboard not interacting with anybody, we have no fuel. But if I get on, if I get on a stage in front of 80,000 people at the Pasadena Rose Bowl, they're all screaming my name, lap up that lovely fuel. So therefore, the narcissist seeks to be famous to get to the top of the fame tree. If I know that my device that I've created is in millions of households around the room, that gives me a pretty good conceit of myself. As I see my inbox flooding with people saying, thank you very much for designing this phone or computer. Lots of fuel coming in from all of those different places. So getting to the top in any organization or structure appeals to the narcissist because it enables us to assert control and it enables us to extract lots of fuel from lots of different appliances, fuel being our lifeblood. Wow. Is there any way that, um, well, I guess that kind of comes towards the ending questions, but I, well, we can jump into it now. So the society itself, the environment, the encouragement or the allowing of say people to, with no kind of foresight or, or no, no kind of intervention legally, there doesn't seem to be any laws, so to speak, to prevent this kind of behavior from happening. And it just seems to carry on. Well, Would you, yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Laws do exist to curtail it to a degree. For instance, if you physically assault somebody, which a narcissist does to assert control, in most places that's a criminal act. And in certain jurisdictions, there is the law of coercive control that has arisen, which covers more in terms of the psychological manipulation of a victim. For instance, not allowing them to see friends, controlling finances, controlling where they go, what they eat, what they wear. Of course, there may be difficulties with evidence to demonstrate it, but the behaviours can be curtailed by bringing the force of the law, criminal or civil, against the narcissist. So the behaviours can be curtailed either by criminal conviction and sentencing or judgment and order. For instance, the narcissist is told he's not allowed to go anywhere near the victim. There is a restraining order. The narcissist is not allowed access to his children. If he does that, as a contempt of court, he could go to prison. The narcissist is told he has to repay this person X amount of $1,000. So there are constraints that can be placed upon the narcissist through the application of the law. Whether you are able to achieve it is a different matter, but the machinery exists to do that. But of course, that tends to be at the end of the scale that you've already suffered in the experiences. You've already been on the receiving end of not being paid, being beaten up, being controlled, and then you bring the law into bear. And I also recognize that you'll be looking at addressing an earlier juncture. Is there anything can be done to stop the march of the narcissist, so to speak? Well, the short answer is no, because the narcissist will create a lack of control environment. And if the narcissist has an issue, then that child runs a risk of becoming a narcissist themselves. And so it continues and continues. And unless there was some way of identifying the relevant gene that is passed on appertaining to narcissism, and basically zapping in some way the relevant narcissist, both male and female, so that the gene can't be passed on, it is going to be passed on. And also, unless that narcissist then exits after procreation and leaves the non-narcissist to bring up the child, but of course it, it might be that the there is a, uh, or, or rather after birth, it might be that the, the child's left with the narcissist, but let's assume the narcissist goes away, but that's not always going to happen. So invariably, the child will be brought up in a lack of control environment. 
Also bear in mind that some of those lack of control environments can actually appear, uh, going back to uh, talking about how narcissism originated, you might have a child, for instance, who has two empathic parents that becomes a narcissist. How might that happen? Grandparent was a narcissist. The gene skipped mum and dad, gets past the child. What about the lack of control environment? How would two empathic individuals create a lack of a control environment? They wouldn't. But what if that child witnessed their parents being murdered by a home invader? The child has no control over that very traumatic event. And that incident in itself is of such trauma to that child, combined with their genetic predisposition, could well cause that child to become a narcissist. Almost like being dunked in a, in a uh, fat fryer. Immediately in, and the narcissism forms as a consequence of that one-off horrendous and traumatic act. Or, for instance, that child's parents are killed in a car crash, and the child could do nothing to save them or prevent them. And therefore, they have experienced a lack of control environment, even though they had a very happy and stable home environment with two loving parents. So you can still get a situation where a narcissist could be created because the genetic predisposition comes from further back in the lineage, and it is in a lack of control environment, which nobody saw coming. So there is always going to be narcissists on the planet, because until you find a way of stopping the genetic predisposition being passed on, there's going to be enough of us to keep breeding, and enough circumstances where the gene will continue and lack of control environments originate. How do you deal with it? You learn to recognize what we are, and it's incumbent upon readers and listeners to be a huge part of this process. I'll give you the information. You have to spread it. And it starts with such things as getting rid of the ridiculous euphemisms that exist for our behavior. He's got an anger management problem. No, nope. that's invariably a narcissist. She's high maintenance. No, nope. you're dealing with a narcissist. He's a player. No. Nope. He's a narcissist. He suffers from sex addiction. No, he doesn't. He's a narcissist. There are too many terms that are used which cause people to think it's something less serious. Narcissism is a serious personality disorder. You ask any victim that's been on the receiving end if they don't think it's serious and see what reaction you get. And accordingly, it's about spreading the, the information so more and more people recognize it at an early stage. And realizing the only thing that you can do about it is to protect yourself remove yourself from the influence of the narcissist you apply no contact wow uh i i didn't that, i didn't know that a traumatic event in itself i didn't know where mm -hmm. trauma played into that so you're saying that you could actually become a narcissist if you have say an early childhood just a super traumatic event and you had the pre um the disposition the genetic that's predisposition right. that's incredible so for most for most narcissists the formation is like um a slow cooker if you will mm -hmm. so you have that genetic predisposition and you're exposed to an environment of abuse or of neglect or a gilded environment where everything's done for you and you're told that you're wonderful and you're brilliant it's all about not having control mm -hmm. and then the narcissism jumps in like an autopilot it's created as a self-defense mechanism to help that child cope because they're not able to they have no control so the narcissism then starts to give them some form of control by shielding them from what is happening by giving them a set of coping mechanisms now of course they're not particularly pleasant coping mechanisms for those who are the recipients but guess what the narcissist doesn't care because the narcissist right. has no emotional empathy conscience remorse or guilt right and of course doesn't realize what they are in most instances and so in some occasions however rather than being this sort of slow cooker approach a one-off very traumatic incident. So take again a child who's got empathic parents but is raped by a childminder. That could, combined with a genetic predisposition, that could be sufficient to cause that child to become a narcissist. I'm not saying that in every instance it will, but it could because you have a lack of control environment that is so deep, wounding and horrendous to that child that the narcissism is created as a self-defense mechanism to it. So you get the sort of slow cooker version or the deep fat fryer to continue the food analogy. <laughs> <laughs> 
Wow, man. This is like blowing my mind. We only have 15 more minutes, man. I have so mm-hmm. many questions. Okay, let me see on? if I can... I, let me see if I can narrow this down to the the, the three mm-hmm. questions that I need to ask you. One of them um, that I want to ask is, you know, L. Ron Hubbard and some of these mm-hmm. cult leaders are, he was an expert hypnotist and he was schooled in NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, the occult. Mm-hmm. In other words, he had all sorts of mind control tools, for lack of a better term, sure. that he studied in order to be able to control people. How many, how much is unconscious by the narcissist? How much will they go out and consciously try to grab tools about how to control people? Or does it all just come naturally? Because when I was studying L. Ron Hubbard, I thought he was unique, but then I realized the narcissist have a freaking playbook that they all play out of, as you know, and it's the Mm -hmm. same goddamn thing over and over Mm -hmm. again. So how much in a situation like L. Ron Hubbard, would he go out and consciously learn the occult, get, you know, learn how to be a hypnotist and all that shit? Or, or or does that just come naturally or, or do they not incorporate those at all? It it depends on what type of narcissist he, he, uh, is. And, I haven't analyzed him to give you a definitive answer there, but if he's lesser or mid range, he's an unaware narcissist. So mm-hmm. what he would do is he would learn about hypnotism for a reason separate to the genuine basis for doing it. So his narcissism in his unconscious would say this, learn about hypnotism. That's a good way for you to control people. He consciously would think he was doing it for a different reason than controlling people. He would not be aware that he was doing it to control. If he was a greater, he would he would know, I am what I am. I need to control people. I know if I bolt on hypnotism to my skill set, there's a very useful way. Now, he will already have been equipped with certain skills and behaviors that enabled him to manipulate. But... In the case of a greater narcissist who is aware, that arsenal can be improved consciously. I need to control people. I hear there's this thing called uh, hypnotism. Let me look into that and learn it and see if that can be utilized for me. In the same way, a greater narcissist will think, I can control this person using money. I need to get myself into a position of having more money than I have now so I can demonstrate my largesse for the purposes of seducing and controlling people. So it all depends. The majority of narcissists are less than mid-range, meaning they don't know what they are, they don't realize they're manipulators, and they behave instinctively. And a lot of people have a very hard time grasping that. They always, yeah. the narcissist knows what he's doing. They don't, because it right. has to be a fast and, and instantaneous self-defense mechanism. As I'm talking to you now, if you heard a loud bang go, You'd shrink down. You'd make yourself small. If you heard what you thought was gunfire, you, you would drop down. You'd make yourself small so you wouldn't be hurt or killed. What you wouldn't do is this. Hmm, what's that noise? Sounds like gunfire. Yeah, that means there might be bullets whizzing through the air. What should I do? I know I'll make myself small because then I won't be injured. Sounds like a good idea. Oh, dear, oh dear I've just been shot. Why? You were too <laughs> slow. You can't think about it. And the bulk of narcissists don't have the inherent function to be able to calculate. They're not good enough at doing it. So it has to be instantaneous and instinctive. They do it without thinking because they have to get control straight away. They can't stand there going, okay, so this lady is accusing me of having an affair. That means she's challenging my control. Well, I don't like that because I have to have control because after all, I am a narcissist. So how can I get control over her? Well, I suppose one method of doing is if I slap her, She'll cry now, and then that means that I've got control over her. I've stopped her accusations, and she's crying as a direct consequence of what I have done. I've got control. I think I'll do that. It's too late. It's too slow. She's already ripped control away from him. So the mid-range narcissist, let's say lower mid-range, he would just go, bomb, and slap her without thinking about it. And, of course, in his mind, the reason he did it was she was being a mouthy bitch. The real reason he did it was because he needed to assert control over her, but he doesn't know it. The greater narcissist knows that he needs control and is able to apply it very quickly because of the speed of response that he he naturally has. And he has an awareness of that and is able to select the appropriate manipulation. And in that example, he is highly unlikely to slap the lady 
and instead is more likely to roll out charm and say, no, 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 look, calm down. What's all this silliness about in the fair? Why don't you sit down next to me and that's it. Let me try your tears. Let's get to the bottom of all of this. And come on, I think you're being awfully silly, aren't you? Come on, there we are. There, that's <laughs> better. A bit of a smile from you now, isn't it? That's what we like to see. And he starts laying on the charm and he's pleasant. Right. So, you tell me about this affair. What, what is it I'm meant to have done? I mean, really, do you think I do that out of, you know, my little puddikins here that I love so much? Oh, come on, you know. And deals with it that way rather than slapping. And he knows in his head, because he goes like this, control being threatened, eternal charm. He does it, not instinctively, but his speed of thought is so much more effective than that of the lesser mid-range. And he knows, he sat there laughing inside, yeah, I know I've had an affair and this is all just sugarcoating to get her to shut up. So I've got control, but I, but I'll do it because it entertains me because I enjoy playing with people. The less from mid range don't think that way. They have an honest belief in what they're doing. They don't see that they have done anything wrong. A greater narcissist knows that he's done wrong, but doesn't care. Less than the less from mid range. They're incapable of seeing it. They're blinded to it by their narcissism and people understand it. They have a tough time getting their heads around that. Not because they're stupid, it just seems such an alien concept to them. The reason being is, of course, non-narcissists are aware of when they are being manipulative. So what happens is they assume, honestly but incorrectly, that the narcissist must know that he's being manipulative because if they know that they're being manipulative, surely the narcissist knows. And it isn't. It's because we have a different perspective to that's such a good point you bring up. And because I felt like I got, I described, I felt like I got as close to sociopathy as I could, as close to L. Ron Hubbard or my mother as I could without falling prey. So I realized by that process that I did have a conscience by getting out of it. But mm -hmm. that's very, very true that people in general, like you said, unless you're a greater or as yourself, mm -hmm. an ultra. You would not mm -hmm. be aware. And it's literally two different perspectives. It's almost two different people. It's, 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 it's it, you know, HG, this <clears throat> lack of understanding by, say, the general population of this unbelievably mm -hmm. important subject called narcissism, mm -hmm. don't you think it happens mostly simply because unless you've experienced it, you can't appreciate what you're some of the stuff you're talking about. You can't well, understand that it's two different yeah. people, man. It, it is entirely. Extent, but remember, many people have experienced it, but they don't realize what it is. Going exactly. back to the point that I made earlier on, because they just think, oh, he's just an asshole. No, actually, mm -hmm. that was a narcissist you were dealing exactly. with. Exactly. Or, oh, you know, he's, you know, he's like a dog with six stings. He's always banging the women. No, that's a narcissist that you're dealing with. Empathic people make mistakes, but they don't habitually engage in a pattern of behavior which is controlling and abusive. And that's the distinction. You see, you were talking about how you felt that you sailed close to sociopathy. Now, mm -hmm. what I suspect happened with you is that you're likely to be an empathic individual. Hence, you were drawn on by these narcissists into the cult. And when that happened, you were subjected to an external stressor, namely the mind washing, the brain washing, the behaviors of this cult. And that pushed down your emotional empathy which meant that your more narcissistic traits came to the fore, causing exactly. you to behave in a particular way. And then exactly. when you extracted yourself from the cult, your emotional empathy came back because exactly. the external stressor had gone. That's exactly what happened. Thank you for diagnosing me. And, you know, I mean, I went to several psychologists and that was more, that one sentence was more helpful than all mm. of those sessions combined. Um, HG, as we end off here, I have so mm. many questions to ask you. God damn it. I wish I could have gotten to more of it. But um, well, you can so, I'll come back. On a, I'll come back on another occasion. That's how we oh, deal with that. Thank you so much, man. I can't thank you enough for coming on here to begin with. I can't believe I'm actually talking to you right now, to be honest. Anyways, um, I'm sure you get that a lot. Anyways, uh, so so yeah, let me ask you this, HG, to conclude. If this, if people became more aware of narcissism, like you said, and like I understand myself, mm -hmm. you just dismissive an asshole. I can't tell you how many times I would tell friends or try to tell them, "Look, you're in a dangerous situation. You don't even yeah. understand what you're dealing with." Oh no, he's just this. Oh no, he's just mm -hmm. that. They don't freaking get the significance of it no. unless maybe it really impacts upon them and they learn mm -hmm. about it. So what mm -hmm. do you think, how do you think we could actually 
educate the population about this unbelievably important subject? And what do you think the world could, could or would look like if, say, maybe not a majority, but a good portion of the population actually understood the ramifications of this subject that we're talking about? What, how would well, things it's a, be it's different? A, it's, a, it's a huge undertaking because, first of all, you have to ensure that the correct information is being provided, which means that you need to get rid of the charlatans. Right. And, of course, you just ask any doctor and he will point to the sort of quack doctors that come out with these various ways of, let's say, treating rheumatism. And you'll have conventional medicine, which is just a way of dealing with it. And then you'll have alternatives. And invariably, those peddling the alternatives, it doesn't work. And they're narcissists who are deluded and think that their way of doing it is correct and, the, and that conventional medicine is absolutely wrong and is Satan's invention. And it's a narcissist that is saying, use my method. If you rub beetroot on the rheumatic area and then walk uh, three times with the shins around a lightning blasted oak, your rheumatism <laughs> will go away. <laughs> and they have utter conviction in that because they're a narcissist. Now, I'm not saying that anybody who involves themselves in alternative medicine is automatically a narcissist, but certain ones exist there. And, the problem, and similarly, when talking about narcissism, there are actually a lot of mid-range narcissists that operate YouTube channels and blogs mm -hmm. talking about narcissism, thinking they are a victim when they are not. And what they do is they continue to provide information which is incomplete and misleading. And you have to get rid of those people and allow the people that do understand it, of which there are a number as well, um, to allow them to be able to explain it. So you need to clear away the nonsense first. And as part of that, you need to get rid of nonsense ideas such as this concept of twin flames. That's the narcissistic right. dynamic, but it's dressed exactly. for something romantic. You need to get rid of these so-called relationship gurus and dating coaches, the pickup artists. They're all, they are either narcissists advocating the narcissistic dynamic but don't know it, or individuals who completely miss it. I spent an afternoon a few years ago going around on the internet looking at certain sites for so-called relationship gurus, agony arts and the like. And I went <laughs> time after time after time from people who were describing being caught in a narcissistic dynamic. And what did the answers come back as? Hmm, take my leaflet on how to love him better. No, you've just told somebody who's in the grip of a narcissist to carry on being with a narcissist. You are an epsilon semi-moron for putting forward that concept. And in each instance, there were many, many incidences of people being involved with narcissists and these so-called experts couldn't spot it. You need to get rid of all of them. How do you do that? Well, yeah. you could try a purge, but invariably uh. what you need to do is give greater prominence to the accurate information so that people turn and think, I'm not listening to that. That's rubbish. So the accurate information needs to be given more prominence. The inaccurate, misleading, euphemistic nonsense will then be less relied on and goes into a death spiral. You also need to ensure that the people who are coming up behind, namely children, are educated about this in some form, in some kind of, I don't know, citizenship class in, in school, because they will have been involved with narcissists, possibly a parent. They will start to form romantic relationships. And these people who find themselves in the grip of a narcissist when they're 16, 17, 18, they've already become ensnared and a pattern is being created and they need to see those red flags at that early juncture. So rather than just think, he's blowing hot and cold with me, you know, what's that all about? Is he playing hard to get? Actually, that individual is a narcissist. And I make the very clear point that you can't say that somebody is a narcissist based on just one set of behavior. You need to look at a range of behavior over time in a pattern. So just saying, oh, he never answers my calls, that doesn't mean that person's a narcissist. It raises a possibility they are because that's an indicator. You need to look at more behaviors. And it's important to stress that point because otherwise people start going around and saying, oh, he talks about himself all the time. He must be a narcissist. No, that's just an indicator. And there may be no other indicators, therefore he isn't a narcissist. Or it was a one-off occasion that he talked about himself. And you can't draw anything from that, so it's important. But in terms of making a change, it's basically 
ensuring the correct information is given the greatest prominence and platform that it possibly can, getting rid of the charlatans, discrediting them, and causing them to go into death spiral so people don't rely on them because they realize that they're talking nonsense and they're not calling it what it is, and that ensuring that people are properly educated in a manner which is more widespread so that they realize these danger signs. For instance, within domestic violence, narcissism is never mentioned or rarely mentioned, yet it's prevalent because the narcissist is an abuser, where it's happening habitually and in a pattern. A one-off incident, that doesn't mean that that person's a narcissist. There might have been an external stress, a drink, redundancy, bereavement, they've lost it and they've lashed out at their partner. Regrettable as that is, that doesn't necessarily mean that person is a narcissist, but if it's happening habitually, there's a pattern of behaviour there, that demonstrates a lack of emotional empathy and a need to control a sense of entitlement to treat that person that way, a lack of accountability for one's behaviour, a haughtiness in the way that that person's being dealt with, believing that they are above that person, that they're superior and special, all the hallmarks of a narcissist. First of all, thank you for um, being a massive um, educator on this subject. Like I said, you're, you're, you're the only source that I've run across that actually all just put all the pieces of the puzzle together. I have so much more to ask you, HG, but we're on the hour. And yes. I just wanted to say again, thank you very much for coming on. And could you please tell people some of the services that you provide? I believe you do Sorry. consultations, you have books, you have endless videos on your incredible. Um, I very much encourage people to go check out. HG doesn't know me. He's not. Prom I, he doesn't know me in any way. I'm promoting him because he helped me out personally, and he doesn't even know that. So um, please go check out his videos, if, especially. If you are curious about what we're talking about or you suspect you might be in a, an abusive relationship with a narcissist or you just want to know more about this, this is the guy's information where you can skip a lot of heartache and a lot of problems and just go get it straight from the source. So could you please tell people where they could find you and about what you offer? Certainly. If you search for NARC site, N-A-R-C-S-I-T-E dot com, you'll find my blog, Knowing the Narcissist. And there are hundreds of free articles there that you can read. It also has links in the menu bar to the Knowledge Vault, where there are over 240 other products, which range in price that you can purchase to give you unrivaled information, practical tips and understanding about other aspects of narcissism, including very helpful assistance packages to deal with situations like divorce and co-parenting, protecting your children. I offer a NARC detector service so that you can ascertain whether you're dealing with a narcissist. You can speak to me through an audio consultation. All of this can be found in the menu bar of my blog. You can find me on YouTube under HG Tudor, Knowing the Narcissist, the Ultra. And there are an increasing number of videos there that are added to on a daily basis. Find very informative, educational, and at times entertaining. Uh, I'm on Twitter and Instagram also, but the two and also Facebook, but the two main places to go to on my blog, narcissite.com, which is Knowing the Narcissist, or on YouTube, and you will see all of the services in the menu bar there, and have a look at all of the testimonials and the comments, which demonstrate the massive range of help that people have got from me. I can attest to that. Again, thank you, thank, HG, thank you so much for coming on here and You're giving me the, the pleasure of talking to you. It has been a real pleasure. Um, thank you very much.